Дополнительные языки. Вначале вступительное слово, и затем вам будет предоставлена возможность задать вопросы. Пожалуйста, Сергей Викторович. Спасибо большое, уважаемые дамы и господа. Рад вас приветствовать на нашей традиционной встрече, которая ежегодно проводится сразу после новогодних рождественских каникул. Поздравляю всех, кто отмечает эти праздники с наступлением 2024 года которые мы все хотим сделать лучше во всех смыслах. И об этом подробно говорил наш президент. Наши планы на направлении внутреннего развития очень четко очерчены. Правительство... A few days ago, the president met the members of the government discussing various issues relating to ensuring sustainable progress of our economy in the context that exists today due to the aggressive and illegitimate policy conducted by the U.S. and its satellites. The task is clear to eradicate any and all need to be dependent on the supply financial bank and logistics chains that are one way or another controlled by or influenced by our Western colleagues. This policy is clearly defined in the decisions that have been made and that remain to be made in the future. As for our foreign policy, we have outlined our key priorities for the foreseeable future. In March, the President adopted the concept of Russia's foreign policy. Its new version has been revised greatly to a great extent, considering the realities of the present. Since the West has proved itself to be impossible to negotiate it with its unreliability, and the global majority does not want to live in such conditions and wants to ensure their development in line with the national interests of each respective country with full respect to the principles of the UN Charter, starting with the principle of respect for sovereign equality of states. Since the adoption of the UN Charter in 1945, not a single foreign policy decision of the West at the international arena respected or even considered this principle of sovereign equality of states, big and small, regardless of their values, religion or traditions. In our foreign policy, we have clearly defined our guiding principles for the development of relations with those who are ready to have equal, mutually respect respecting relations via a frank dialogue and negotiations in order to find a balance of interests rather than make some decisions that will only serve someone's narrow self-serving plans, as it happens in the vast majority of cases when discussions involve the West headed by the United States. 2023 has shown that such manners typical of the Western hegemony that rely on their own self-serving interests and disregard everyone else's interests are evident. They ruled the world for almost 500 years and did not have any competition with the probable exception of the Soviet period. They did not have any serious competitors throughout that period. And probably that made them complacent. They got used to being the hegemon. However, life is going forward. There are emerging and strengthening centers of economic growth, centers of financial power, political influence. These centers are surpassing the United States 
and other Western countries in their development. I am sure that you are aware of our assessment of the situation in the relations with the People's Republic of China, the fastest growing economy in the world together with India. Our relations with China are living through the best period in the history. It is particularly valuable that President Xi Jinping paid his first visit after his re-election to Moscow in uh, March 2023. In his turn, President Putin also visited China in October 2023 to participate in the Belt and Road Forum. Our relations of strategic and privileged partnership with India are consistently developing. We maintain regular context, contacts on the highest level. We also have contacts between our foreign policy agencies and other ministries and agencies. Speaking of our immediate neighbors and uh, close-minded, our like-minded countries, the Middle East region, including the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Iran, and other countries of the region, are of interest. And we are interested in cooperating with individual countries and regional stru structures alike. The Gulf Cooperation Council, the Arab League, ASEAN, the African Union, CELAC, and other organizations are something that we cooperate with. As for African countries, we are elevating our partnership to a strategic level, something that was confirmed at the second Russia-Africa summit that took place in St. Petersburg in July 2023. An important step in development of our relations with the Latin American continent was the interparliamentary conference between Russia and Latin America that was held in autumn 2023. Both Africa and Latin America, just like the above mentioned Asian countries, are emerging independent centers of the multipolar world. We have been actively working at the United Nations The Group of Friends in Defense of the UN Charter was established a few years ago and is working successfully. This group adopts joint statements on the principled matters related to global development. This group is actively galvanizing the United Nations General Assembly by promoting joint initiatives, including Russia's initiatives. And we likewise support the initiatives proposed by our partners in this group of friends. I would also like to highlight another important event. The fact that the UNGA passed another resolution on inadmissibility of glorification of Nazism, something that has become a regular occurrence. Despite the West's machinations, it was adopted by a landslide. And I would like to point out that for the second time in a row, Germany, Italy, and Japan voted against this document. The Axis countries that back in the day after being defeated in the Second World War publicly expressed their repentance for the crimes committed during the Second World War. Back in the day, they were assuring everyone that such crimes would not be repeated. However, in recent years, we see these countries voting against this resolution, demanding that Nazism not be revived. And it makes one wonder in what direction the ideological processes, both in these three countries and in the West in general, are developing. We have been constructively engaged in other formats as well. Here I would like to mention our, immediate, our closest allies 
I am talking about the Union State of Russia and Belarus, as well as the Collective Security Treaty Organization. As part of the CSTO activities, we have been promoting insurance stability in all of its dimensions, including its military aspect, as well as biological security and security in terms of new challenges and threats, including terrorism, drug trafficking, and other kinds of organized crimes. The Eurasian Economic Union is also worthy of mention. It has passed certain decisions about deepening Eurasian integration as well as ensuring cohesion of these processes with the Belt and Road Initiative promoted by China. The EAEU is cooperating with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, with ASEAN and other associations and countries located on our common Eurasian continent. Russia chaired the Commonwealth of Independent States, CIS, correction, Russia has become chairman of the CIS and we intend to continue the useful projects that started last year. For example, we are going to pay particular attention to the fact that in Bishkek in autumn last year, an international organization for the Russian language was established. This initiative was proposed by Kazakhstan and received support by all members of the Commonwealth. This organization is open for participation to all countries of the world. We know that the Russian language is popular everywhere in the world on all continents, and we are hoping that there will be a a lot of members interested in the participation. I have mentioned the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as an umbrella project. Together with the EAEU, ASEAN and other sub-regional structures, we are trying to ensure an objective and natural formation of a greater Eurasian partnership, something President Putin spoke about at the first Russia-ASEAN summit. And we can already see the contours of this emerging partnership. In this context, it's essential to make sure that an economic partnership serving the interests of all countries on our shared continent is developed. It would be wrong to miss out on the advantages of existing on this shared space, this shared continent especially given that this continent has been a driving force in the growth of global economy for many years and will remain one for many years to come. Besides mutually beneficial economic projects, we also need to ensure military and political security in Eurasia. We are going to make sure that this task is resolved by countries of the continent without any attempts from out-of-region countries to insert themselves into these processes, bringing their own ideas and uh, dictating their will to others. Eurasia is more than capable to ensure its security itself. I've spoken about regional structures, but there are region, uh, also global structures such as BRICS, which is a symbol of the regions of the multipolar world. And right now, the last year's South Africa summit took a decision to extend the BRICS membership, which became a very important step starting from the 1st of February, Russia takes up the baton in BRICS and we'll do everything in our power to make sure that the newcomers fit perfectly into our common agenda, thereby contributing to strengthening positive trends, not just within BRICS itself, but also in the international arena in general, in the interest of the world majority. Given the fact that more than 20 countries, almost 30 countries are interested in getting closer together with BRICS, 
given that this association with the global membership in our eyes has a bright future ahead of it. I would also like to add that just as we did previously, we give priority to protecting legitimate rights of Russian citizens abroad, the fact that they are facing discrimination in the countries of the collective West. This is a fact well known to you. Many of you are writing about that, unlike your Western counterparts who are increasingly often trying to hide the truth about how journalists feel in the countries of well-established democracy, pardon the expression. But apart from the everyday problems that our citizens are facing in the US and in Europe, as well as in other countries, certainly ever-present are emergencies of natural origin as well as man-made disasters. So recently we have been assisting in the evacuation of Russian citizens as well as the CIS countries and some other countries from the Gaza Strip and uh, some months before that we helped with the evacuation from Sudan where a conflict had broken out. As far as public diplomacy uh, is concerned, I would like to point out such a milestone as the establishment of the International Russophile Movement last year. This is an informal association of uh, people who live across different continents and yet feel some kind of spiritual proximity with Russia. The inauguration of the movement took place and the first Congress is scheduled to take place in the first half of 2024. We're most so certainly going to promote the ideals of truth and justice in international affairs. We shall spare no efforts to render international relations more democratic. And in that sense, the Russian Foreign Ministry is actively supporting the United Russia Initiative of hosting an international inter-party forum of uh, advocates of the fight against the uh, modern practices of neocolonialism. The plans are to host that event in Moscow. The neocolonial nature and essence of the West's policy is uh, pronounced in the current policies pursued by the US and its allies and the essence is basically the same as it used to be, namely to use to their own advantage the resources coming from other countries. In other words, basically living at the expense of other countries. The forthcoming forum promises to be very interesting. It promises to be an important event. As far as the cultural agenda is concerned, Russia is preparing to host a number of uh, high-profile events, such as the International Youth Festival, as you know. But little time is left before its opening. Also, the um, Games of the Future, integrating physical sport and also cyber sport, the BRICS Games in Kazan in February, and in summer, these events are going to take place. The International Intervision Singing Competition is also going to be held, and it is going to be attended by representatives of the world majority. And we will do everything in our power to make sure that the guests of ours who come to these events and to other events enjoy and take advantage of the Russian hospitality, just as it was the case in 2018 when Russia hosted the World Cup finals. And in conclusion, I would like to reaffirm our openness to communicating with the media in various formats. The representatives of the ministry present here, I believe, cannot be reproached for avoiding contact with journalists and other heads 
of departments and other high dignitaries of the ministry when they go to international events or when they're here they're not just trying they also have it as their duty to speak and tell you about our job they have the duty to make sure that our activities are well understood and uh, are open thank you and now we're ready to pass to q a session uh re novelty please if you'll allow me uh, minister two questions first question minister in case ukraine holds elections this year is it possible that a person comes to power there who is willing to talk to russia and how vital is it from russia's point of view how central is uh, the agreement between ukraine and great britain has been concluding uh, concluded and also what do you think about the probability of conclusion of similar agreements with other countries like the g7 countries honestly we are not that concerned with the hiccups that come up uh, and the political life of Ukraine, yes, the issue of elections has come up. We have heard that the West is insisting that Zelensky should hold such elections, probably uh, supposing that the electoral campaign and the vote itself would probably allow them to uh, steer Zelensky closer to the West's interests because very often he is deviating from those interests right now. He is often saying that elections are not going to take place because the war is raging on. But it seems as if all of that had been orchestrated. It's as if this person and his accomplices are doing everything in our power to cling on to power. And I see this desire of his to cling on to power. The, West's, the West wants uh, greater flexibility here because uh, the West has already understood that the bleeds creek that was uh, so much uh, promoted and advertised uh, with a view to uh, dealing a strategic defeat to Russia had failed and the paradigm has shifted especially within the uh, minds of the West the West has realized its mistake, even though it's difficult for them to admit that. So they're trying to send some external signals right now. On the one hand, these signals allow them to continue supporting Ukraine. On the other hand, it allows them to continue pushing Kiev to be more pliable and more obedient to its Western masters. How this is going to play out, I don't know. And you had a second question. The second question was about the agreement between uh, Kiev and London, the security agreement. How does it fit into the uh, future settlement? Well, this is not something new. Some years ago, when there were clashes about admitting Ukraine into NATO, the EU, and some other countries, they were not that happy. Not everyone was happy, and they understood, some of them, that it would be yet another irresponsible, risky step from the point of view of European security. So it's just kind of a half-baked product. Namely, this uh, idea of concluding bilateral agreements with certain Western countries. I've heard about the contents of the document agreed upon by Zelensky and Sunak. And judging by that document, I do not see any legally binding agreements apart from Ukraine's obligation to defend the British Isles should an invasion be mounted against the UK. Well, um, somewhat funny, somewhat comedic, maybe it's a continuation of uh, Neighborhood 95, uh, maybe 
the name has been changed of this uh, band of comedians. But be that as it may, these agreements do not change our goals, and this has recently been confirmed by President Putin in our special military operation. We're going to uh, achieve our goals, doing that persistently and consistently. The goals will be achieved from time to time. The West is sending some signals, then these signals are taken back, as it were. We are taking these signals philosophically. Our president has pointed out on numerous occasions that Russia is not refusing to talk. He said that back in 2022, when at the behest of Boris Johnson and other Anglo-Saxons, Kiev was forbidden from concluding a settlement agreement with uh, Russia. It happened in April 2022. This story is well known now. And uh, speaking about this subject back in 2022, our president pointed out that Russia did not refuse to talk, but he said that everyone else needs to understand that if they refuse talks, then the longer this would drag on and the more difficult it would be. And we see this prophecy has now come to pass. There are no hopes right now that Russia is going to be uh, somehow defeated. This has been pointed out on multiple occasions. Those who have not learned their history and geography, you know, there are many uh, people like that in the West. They can fantasize about that. They can write yet another scenario for this uh, neighborhood 95, but it's going to have no bearing on life. Sana, agency, please. Sana Agency, Syria Channel. Minister, first allow me to wish you a happy new year. I would like to wish the Russian people victories on every avenue. Right now, the U.S. is establishing military and political coalitions that are mounting and aggression against Yemen. They're also continuing and uh, condoning Israel in the genocide of the Palestinian people, as well as the military action against the peoples of Lebanon and Syria. What's the assessment of Russia with regard to these actions? We have repeatedly made public statements uh, providing our assessment of what is currently unfolding in the Middle East, not just in the Gaza Strip, or the Palestinian territories, but also around Lebanon, around Iraq, and uh, around Yemen as well. Indubitably, the U.S., together with the U.K., as well as a number of other allies of theirs, have overstepped and uh, basically trampled into the ground all the uh, norms of international law, including the UN Security Council resolution that has only called for protecting commercial navigation. No one has given any authority to anyone to bomb Yemen, just as not a single uh, authorization has been given back in 2011 to NATO to bomb Libya. The only resolution that was adopted back then was about establishing a no-fly zone above uh, Libya. So it was to prevent the Libyan Air Force from uh, taking to air, and it was not the forces were not taken to the air. There was no legal authority there, but the country was bombed into nothingness, into a black hole. Right now, no one can put the country back together again. Droves of migrants have rushed to Europe, uh, and this is uh, the bail of Europe, whereas uh, the UK and the US have been spared that, whereas uh, the heart of Africa was engulfed with terrorists that were used, had been used by the West in order to overthrow Gaddafi. And the same chaos and lack of uh, legal observance is uh, seen 
with in the case of Yemen right now and all the pretexts and justifications coming from Washington seem uh, just pathetic. And against this background, just a couple of days ago in Davos, uh, State Secretary Blinken made an announcement saying that the, all, all the Middle Eastern countries wanted a U.S. presence and they want that the U.S. should play a leading role in the region. Well, it's difficult for me to judge how big is that desire of theirs. I think we should ask them. But just one of the countries in the Middle East, Iraq, namely, said and uh, made a decision a couple of years ago. This decision was as follows. Thank you, uh, Americans. Uh, you stayed as guests here for several years, but let's put an end to that and let's see you out. And just recently, we've heard from Baghdad that the Americans uh, do not want to go, even though they've been asked to go for quite some time. And that's deplorable. And particularly deplorable is uh, the fact that Blinken has pointed out that only the U.S. can play an intermediary role, only the U.S. is capable of achieving some kind of a settlement between Palestinians and Israelites. He spoke about that. We here and we know about those semi-official contacts with the participation of the U.S., Israel, several Arab countries. But these contacts do not imply a direct uh, dialogue between Israel and Palestine. These contacts imply that some grown-up adults, grown-up men, are going to reach some kind of agreement and then impose that on Palestinians. But this is not going to work. Only direct dialogue, which needs to be resumed, can be the answer. This dialogue used to happen, albeit arduous and difficult, but some progress was being made with the support of the international intermediary quartet the uh, quarters of intermediaries in the Middle East, uh, the U.S., the U.N., Russia, and the EU, and we've always advocated the participation of the quarter as well as the uh, Arab League, but that was blocked. That was uh, prevented from happening by the Europeans and the Americans, regrettably, and then the Americans have basically, as they think, disbanded the quarter, monopolizing the mediation process. You might remember that in September last year, National Security Advisor of, uh, of the U.S., uh, Jake Sullivan, said that never before had the Middle East enjoyed more peace and quiet than several years uh, before. And just several months after, a conflict in the Gaza Strip broke out. So we should probably rely on collective effort, something the U.S. is no longer accustomed to. The U.S. is accustomed to uh, dictating its conditions. On Tuesday next week, there's going to be a special session of the U.N. Security Council on this subject. We intend to take part in this meeting, and I'm supposed to go to New York to attend this meeting, we are going to uh, present our initiatives with a view to resuming collective effort rather than trying to act on one's own. It's not that the United States wants to impose their agenda there, but also worldwide. We'll wait and see as it goes. I believe that real life is going to teach our Western colleagues a lesson as well as the regional countries should insist, insist that it is their place to live. And for them, the security of all the nations in the vicinity is decisive. External advice will not be banned, I think, but the final definitive decision rests with the regional stakeholders. And the main 
area of of the efforts would be an establishment of a Palestinian state in line with the UN Security Council decisions in full conformity with those, a state that would be viable and exist in security and good neighborhood side by side with Israel and other regional countries. Otherwise, no matter what is going to happen, we will, I'm sure, see the relapses of the violence that is ongoing in, in Gaza, because without a Palestinian, the, the Palestinian state established, the people of Palestine will feel oppressed, encroached upon, will live uh, in injustice, and generation after generation of young Palestinians will pass it down to their children. So the definitive outcome must be the establishment of a Palestinian state. I, I really hope that the Israeli leadership will come to this conclusion. At this point, not everybody in Israel believes it's acceptable for that country. But, you know, nothing can be done about that. We only can dialogue and talk and explain, but without a Palestinian state in place, Israel will not have its security safeguarded, and it's in Russia's interests that the Israelis live in security. It is a long-lasting partner of ours. We were the first nation to recognize their independence now, around two million citizens reside there and stay there who have double nationality of Israel and Russia. And definitely we care about that and we are ready to play an active part in guaranteeing a full-fledged settlement that would safeguard Israel's security in full conformity with the UN Security Council's resolutions on the Palestinian issue, international life outlet. Well, Mr. Minister, last year the rumor was, the information was that the United State, States submitted some written proposals to Russia to launch a negotiation process on arms control. Back then, the MFA of Russia confirmed that and that a, an official response was being contemplated. So, uh, after all, was there a response submitted to the ES? And uh, the second point is, do you see any, any prospects, any future and possibility of resuming the dialogue with the ES on strategic stability? Is it possible? Is it appropriate now? Is it called for, given the current context? of the standoff with the West and against the backdrop of the blatantly hostile policies by Washington. Well, with respect to the prospects of resuming the strategic dialogue with the United States, a lot has been said on that of late. And this topic comes up every now and then in, in, in conversations in contacts with mass media, but talking about these prospects in earnest, being adult people, is impossible. Separating that from the overall international situation and the strategic stability situation as of today, the patterns and manifestations are extremely negative and the things have been aggravating which has to do primarily with the heightening of the processes that lead the world from a unipolar to a multipolar order. And the West that has been at the helm of the global developments for 500 years definitely is trying to balk fiercely and, and we're having an eye on that, and they do not want to see this transition to the multipolarity. By this, they are countering the 
the real objective course of history, and they're trying to to cling to their global dominance that is slipping away from them and trying to contain these developments. The West stops at nothing in terms of means and ways to counter those who are against those hegemonic feats and uphold the uh, equality principles enshrined in the UN Charter. Instead, the West has been trying to maintain its unbridled global dominance. Primarily, it is the policy of Washington, but they you know they stumble over more and more obstacles. One of these obstacles is Russia that has demonstrated resolve not to see its interests encroached, being a great power and one of the global civilizational centers. With respect to the firmness of our, of our policy and our tech, there was a direct relationship between the degree of firmness of ours and the degree of hostility of the United States, and the United States has opted to see the unchecked expansion of the anti-Russian alliance of NATO in the post-Soviet space they have provoked the Ukrainian conflict. And as you know, we did not put up with the, the, with the weaponizing of the Kyiv regime as a tool to create direct threats to our security, not overseas, but close to our borders, next to us, next door. And definitely we would not reconcile ourselves with the use of the Kyiv regime in a frontal assault against all Russian things like the language, culture, education, and Russian speakers who lived on those territories that had been developed by their forefathers for centuries. And these territories have always remained part of the Russian world and Russian soil, Russian land, and, and Kyiv is meant to be converted into a weapon to destroy this common memory and destroy and decouple all kind of ties between the Russian and the Ukrainian peoples, which is also a direct threat to our interests in response to the measures that we took in order to safeguard and protect our interests, our outbound, if I may say so. The United States has unleashed a total hybrid war in order to reach a political and economic and diplomatic strangling of Russia to choke us and also defeat us in the battlefield. That was all stated in public. In parallel with these developments that we all are witnessing, we do not see any, any minor, any slightest interest in the United States of the West to settle the Ukrainian conflict in a fair way. They do not want to listen to our concerns. They do not want to talk in earnest about removing the fundamental contradictions. On the contrary, the West has been leading towards the escalation of the Ukrainian crisis, which now creates additional strategic risks and perils. You can see as the ex-command of the Commanders of the U.S. forces in Europe, Hodges and Breedlove, giving advice, public advice to the key regime to bomb the Crimea into nothing, into submission, so that no one can reside there. But these are retired politicians. With respect to the active politicians, we know for sure that such guidelines and recommendations and advice has been given by by the British in their context with the Kyiv regime. You know, they did not learn lessons of life. They said that they would support Kyiv for as long as it takes. Now they 
start saying that they will support Kyiv for as long as is possible. This is a minor change reflecting the the changing situation, but you know, this is up to them. Well, to give an instance, we could see a similar turnaround in Afghanistan. For 20 years, the Americans stayed there. Was it for as long as it was necessary or for as long as it was possible? Did they arrive at somewhere there? Did they fulfill something or anything? Same refers to, to, to Iraq. All the reckless undertakings of the United States in, in the military field, did any of them yield any positive effect, any, any establishment of democracy that it, was all, it had, had been meant for? And the Ukraine is in for uh, a similar fate. They rely on their masters. They are not aware that the master only thinks of himself, not about you. And you cannot count on on making allowances for your people's interests. So you, they have been nudging Ukraine to use long-range strike assets and missiles to impact Intel Air, the Crimea, and also the hinterland of the Russian soil. Apart from the, the connivance and nudging, they have also been submitting the necessary weapons. And that means that the West is not willing to pursue a constructive course that would take into account the legitimate concerns of the Russian Federation. So such destructive policies on the part of the United States has led to a profound degradation to put it bluntly, of the Russian-American relationship and a root and branch change of the security situation versus the period of the START treaty signing. Washington has simply cast aside all the understandings and principles that underpinned the interaction between our countries back in the past, including in, in the sphere of arms control. The preamble of this START treaty says that we reached an agreement to uh, be sticking to the indivisible security principle when no one, no one improves one security at the expense of the security of the other. What This principle was trampled upon in the context of preparing and unleashing the Ukrainian conflict. Also, the preamble of that instrument says that the, the U.S. and Russia uh, would build their relationship on, on basing on the trust and cooperation. In reality, the United States opted for a military prevalence and supremacy and they dismantled step by step the the missile controls and the arms controls and the INF treaty and the open skies treaty same was the fate of the CFE treaty and the start itself the start treaty itself as the United States created a context that would preclude its, implementa its implementation. The, the American side back then froze and suspended the, the bilateral dialogue, citing an unfavorable backdrop. They canceled a round of talks in 2022 20, December, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, but not long ago they all of a sudden once again remembered about the importance of a strategic matters dialogue and they have submitted some signals, some cues about their readiness and they they suggested that the talks on strategic stability should be set aside 
from the overall military and political context, should be separated from the overall context. And this context is, you know, irreconcilably hostile towards us. And they told us, well, we keep chastising you always, everyone, uh, every now and then. And we want you to move back to the frontiers of the 1991 and leave the poor democratic Ukraine alone. We'll keep doing that. But at the same time, meanwhile, let's sit down at a table and talk about the specific topic of the strategic arms control and limitations. They said some time ago they touched upon this topic and only in order to resume the inspections and visit our nuclear facilities. At the same time, they supplied arms to Ukraine with the help of which our military bases of strategic bombers were impacted and shelled. So these are the people that do not know about and anything about conventions or etiquette, to say nothing about the comprehensive understanding of of the international context and the the framework of prospective talks, and that does not surprise us, and that they have proclaimed us openly an enemy, but at the same time, they want to have a look at our strategic nuclear stockpiles, because they say it's quite a different thing. So uh, under the slogan of reciprocity, they actually want to ensure oversight over our nuclear arsenals to minimize risks for themselves. And um, these risks are mounting as a result of the military pressure and compulsion exercise exercised against our country. And they talk every day more about a prospective collision of nuclear powers. And uh, every day there are less, fewer and fewer deterrent deterring factors, containing factors, and the Germans and the Poles speak publicly in earnest about training some of the true NATO troops so that they should enter the Ukrainian soil and um, get deployed there and occupy some, some positions. These are people in power in those countries, so we believe that American ideas are unacceptable and they have not been concealing their designs while talking about the strategic stability. They're saying that the non-nuclear forces should be factored out or, and, and left aside from the talks so that the West wants to enshrine its advantage and uh, assert its quantitative advantage in terms of these assets, so we do not see against the backdrop of the hybrid war conducted by Washington against Russia, we do not see any possible grounds to implement any additional measures on the matter of arms control to see the reduction of uh, strategic risks and we do not see any, any chance to talk with the United States about the strategic stability. We do not cast it aside altogether for future and we never did that. No, no, we shrug off a possibility of a diplomatic settlement, but, you know, we firmly condition such a possibility on on the preliminary uh, refusal of the West to pursue their comprehensively aggressive attack against our country, trying to subvert every domain of, of ours. Apart from that, any hypothetical and prospective interaction in future in the matter of strategic stability would require the United States to get ready to consider this topic, taking into account the full plethora of the factors that have a bearing on the strategic stability, not only the aspects that are of the strategic stability that are for in for well in the interest of Washington. They do not want in, and uh, are not eager to contemplate 
the strategic stability comprehensively, and it cannot uh, happen in the current context. So critically important contradictions must be lifted and removed. I'm referring to the NATO's, NATO's expansion eastwards, and this is something we talked about in December 2021. Well, we talked about that. We had talked about that long ago, but in December 2021, we came up with specific proposals that were capable of preventing the current conflict and save Europe's economy that is now being drowned by the Americans with a lot of effect, but they spurned our proposals back then. As for your question about whether we have informed the Americans about that, in December 2023, we send our ideas that I have briefly outlined just now to them as a paper, just like the written proposals sent to us by the Americans. These assessments have no alternative to us, and we suppose that everything has been said on that matter, and there is nothing left to say. Sinhua, please. Make sure to switch on your mic, please. In your armrest, you have the microphone. Maybe that's a Japanese mic. That could be the problem. Good afternoon. Minister Lavrov, I'm a reporter from Xinhua. My question is, if we were to ask you to describe the results of the work in Russian-Chinese relations in 2023 in two or three words, what would be these words and why? What do you expect our bilateral relations to be like in 2024? Thank you. In my introductory remarks, I have already mentioned that just like our leaders have repeatedly said, Russian-Chinese relations are going through the best period in their history. There has been a number of summit-level declarations that stipulate that these relations are now stronger, more reliable, and more advanced than a military alliance as it was seen during the Cold Era War, uh, Cold War era. Naturally, it does not reflect any spheres where our relations with China wouldn't be flourishing. The 200 billion barrier that was set as a purpose was actually surpassed last year, and this trend is continuing to uh, go on. And now that the West is destroying the foundations of globalizations that it itself had promoted, that the West is using sanctions-based tools and other illegitimate measures, we, on the other hand, are switching to different mechanisms developing our trade and investment cooperation that would not be subject to Western influence. National currencies now account for about 90 percent of money used in our bilateral trade turnover. Similar trends are visible in our trade relations with other countries, too. Not only summit mechanisms, namely meetings between the Russian and the Chinese presidents, but there is also the mechanism of annual meetings between heads of government, which account for the preparatory work in uh, various intergovernmental commissions headed by deputy prime ministers. We don't have such a level of broad economic relations with any other country. This strategic 
interaction and uh, comprehensive cooperation enables us not only to coordinate our mutually beneficial cooperation and various projects, but also enables us to work to bring these ideas to life. Annually, we hold cultural events, humanitarian educational cooperation is also underway. I think that these relations are very promising in accordance with the guiding principles decided on here in Russia in March 2023 when President Xi visited Russia after his re-election as well as in October where President Putin was the guest of honor at the third Belt and Road International Forum. In 2024, we have already scheduled a number, a series of events that will continue the trend of our high level and highest level cooperation in all avenues of Russian Chinese cooperation and partnership. There is a plethora of words that would uh, describe in superlative terms our excellent cooperation. But I don't want to choose just one or two or three words. However, the exception to that would be the word friendship. You probably remember Russians and Chinese are brothers forever. This saying was very popular in the Soviet era here in the Soviet Union. Maybe it was a bit artificial because, uh, truth be told, Soviet-Chinese relations soured a little bit after that. But right now, more and more Russians visit China as tourists or for business, as part of cultural and educational exchanges. When our compatriots, when our fellow Russians share their impressions, about the communication with uh, ordinary Chinese people. When they go to China and meet Chinese people, they are always full of enthusiasm and exuberance when they describe this feeling of mutual liking. Right now, we are actively promoting cross-border ties between neighboring regions of Russia and China. And it is, of course, also part of the overall positive trend. Naturally, some tasks need to be resolved. A lot remains to be done in economy, trade, because naturally everyone is interested in getting the best deal possible. But in any case, without exception, Russia and China's interests always come to a common denominator and we are able to resolve any and all issues that arise. Task agency, please. Minister Lavrov, good afternoon. Artyom Popov, TAS agency. The leaders of Armenia and Azerbaijan recently exchanged some cutting remarks the issue at hand was uh, the, rela the co communication between Azerbaijan and uh, Armenian borders and reopening the borders. Armenia has a different opinion on the matter. What's your take on that? Will this exchange of cutting remarks hinder the normalization of Armenia-Azerbaijani relations? My second question is, recently in the media, a number of um, articles were published about the possibility of possible direct negotiations between Russia and Ukraine, with Geneva mentioned as a possible platform for such negotiations. Is that true? Is Moscow ready for such a scenario? As for the Armenian-Azerbaijani settlement, true enough, in uh, the past few days, Armenian and Azerbaijani leaders, in their public remarks, touched upon the topic of establishing ties between the, the Azerbaijani mainland, so to say, and the Sichevani. And Prime Minister Pashinyan also said 
that Armenia categorically rejected the Zangazur corridor. This corridor was not part of the agreements reached by President Putin, President Aliyev, and Prime Minister Pashinyan. In the statement pub, uh, signed on November the 9th, 2020, that put an end to the war, said, deblocking all economic and transport ties. It also said that Armenia would guarantee safety of transport between uh, Azerbaijan and Nehichivani in both directions, and that control over this transport would be within the remit of the border service of the Russian Federal Security Service. I almost quoted that document that was uh, signed on November the 9th, 2020, trilaterally. The remarks made by Mr. Pashinyan, who said that he wanted similar terms for transit through Armenia, similar to the ones that would be used for transit from Azerbaijan to Nakhichevan via Iran. I can hardly follow the logic because these routes are hardly compatible. It's impossible to compare them. The uh, deputy prime minister level working group established in 2021 agreed that when transport and logistic ties are improved and routes are deblocked, the countries preserve sovereignty and jurisdiction over these routes on their territory an important point to reiterate. In the Trilateral Working Group in May 2023, correction, in June, the Trilateral Working Group at the level of Deputy Prime Ministers came to an agreement about resuming railroad transport that was agreed upon, that was also discussed by President Putin in Yerevan when he paid a visit to Armenia. There was a separate meeting with Prime Minister Pashinyan on the sidelines of the CSTO summit. And I remember that meeting. It was a very positive one, but after that it just went up in, into the air for some reason. And we are very clear that such setbacks after agreements reached is not a rare occurrence. What became the obstacle from finalizing these agreements on paper about the principles of uh, deblocking the transport cohesion between Azerbaijan and Kichevan? We only know that the uh, kind advice made by the Western friends are always there in the South Caucasus. And sometimes this advice are perceived by certain participants of the process very seriously. But the Western advice is typically aimed not at looking for agreements between regional countries on the, on the basis of balance of interests, but rather on promoting the West's own geopolitical interests. The, there is no alternative to resuming this transport communication and uh, its parameters have been enshrined in the trilateral documents. The uh, route goes through Armenia's sovereign territory controlled by the border service of the Russia's, Russian Federal Security Service. The document also established the uh, procedure for border and customs control at the entry point to Armenia from Azerbaijan and at the exit point from Armenia to the Azerbaijani Nakhichevan. As for 
the rumors about direct negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. Well, that's what they are, rumors. Everyone is clear that it's not Ukraine that will decide when to stop, when to begin serious talks about realistic terms to put in an end to the conflict. And that would naturally mean rejecting its Nazi ideology and rhetorics, rejecting racism, regarding everything Russian, rejecting their aspirations to NATO membership. These are not dreams. These are terms for preserving the Ukrainian nation as an independent nation that would have its own identity rather than just carry out somebody else's orders. to vex Russia. Naturally, we need to speak to the West about that, and today we have already spoken about how in April 2022, the West prohibited Ukraine from signing the agreements The West is not interested in any negotiations. Clearly and evidently it is Washington that is calling the shots. In Davos, Blinken, if I remember correctly, said he didn't see even a remote prospect for negotiations, not just on the settlement, but also on a long-term truce in Ukraine. They don't even want to talk about Ukrainian settlement. Sometimes they make Freudian slips when they said declaring a truce to supply Ukraine with more weapons. This is what they did with the Minsk agreements. Speaking of the Minsk agreements, it was in Davos that Zelensky detailed with great gusto. Well, maybe he wasn't in his top form, just like he was during his uh, quartal uh, 95 days. But he spoke about the Minsk agreements and accused Russia and President Putin personally of stealing 13 years of peace from the world. He made a direct claim that after 2014, And he said that it was the Moscow regime, as they say, started it. There was no coup d'etat. There was just the annexe of Crimea. And he said that after 2014, Germany and France tried their best and agreed upon an intermediary solution, and Putin ruined it all. It is flabbergasting how a man can just unblinkingly say such things with such frankness, because the Minsk agreements were not an intermediary step. They were supposed to be the final decision made regarding this problem. Secondly, as you probably know, the Minsk agreements were not destroyed by Putin. Merkel and Hollande were not trying to ensure that these agreements work. Both Merkel and Hollande confessed to having signed these agreements just to gain some time to prepare Ukraine for the war. So these are obvious facts that have been announced publicly. They were analyzed, commented upon, discussed by many politicians and journalists. But Without much ado, Zelensky is lying to the world community from the tribune of the World Economic Forum in Davos. So how 
Is it possible to talk to such uh, people, even though his decree, uh, especially because his decree prohibiting Ukraine from talking to Russia, has not been annulled? President Putin has said that uh, first the decree has to be uh, abolished. And then we'll see Armenian news agency, please. Minister Lavrov, I've got two questions. Yes, yes, we can hear you. The first question, you know, uh, the interview by Elam Aliyev has been mentioned. It had some harsh remarks with regard to Armenia. Armenia has already criticized that. And there have been some statements about backsliding in the negotiating process. What's your current assessment of the current negotiating process between Baku and Yerevan on the subject? And my second question, what about what of relations between Armenia and Russia? Uh, have the issues been resolved? And what's the progress as far as the Armenia Azerbaijani settlement goes? I believe uh, we should be coy. We should go as far as to say that the 2020-2022 agreements, trilateral settlements that uh, agreements that were signed were very important. I've spoken about the first statement just recently, and it's uh, regrettable that such a practically beneficial issue to Armenia as the uh, deblocking the route is still on the paper. And I, uh, w with all due respect, I think the reason is the position of Yerevan. I do not know where they get their advice from, but maybe uh, some advice does come through. We saw Germany, the US, France. As soon as they realized that the Russian, Armenian, Armenian Azerbaijani process is yielding some results in deblocking the uh, routes, in delineating the border, in uh, drafting a peace agreement, started to uh, insert themselves into these processes without any invitation playing the role of a spoiler. Just remember 2003 and Transnistria. Back then, Russia was acting as an intermediary. And in 2003, Dmitry Kozak, who back then was responsible for this uh, dossier, managed to uh, agree upon the so-called Cossack Memorandum, which was initialed by both sides, and the signing agreement was planned back then. The President of Moldova made a call to President Putin, and he said, I'm sorry, yes, we did initial the agreement, but the EU forbids us from uh, signing the memorandum because uh, the uh, document does not have some things the EU wants to be reflected there. It was not an agreement with the EU. It was an agreement between Transnistria and Moldova. So 20 years ago, the Moldovan issue, the Transnistrian issue, could have been settled, just as it was the case seven years, years ago with uh, Ukraine when the Minsk agreement were adopted. I've got every ground to believe that the West is reluctant to see the agreements facilitated by Russia between Baku and Yerevan uh, coming into uh, reality. I've uh, spoken about the uh, road through Sarnisky uh, region. Armenia has some issues with deblocking the route as it was stipulated in the trilateral statement. Armenia is uh, putting forth additional requirements with regard to ensuring security along the road. They do not want Russian border guards for being stationed there, even though that's been enshrined in the document. They do not want neutral customs and border controls. 
They want to do that on their own, which goes contrary to what had been agreed upon. And the same goes for the delimitation of the border. We offered our services. Moreover, the two sides signed an agreement on establishing a delimitation committee which uh, would include the Russian side as an intermediary. We have not been invited to this committee. Charles Michel has already announced that it's the EU that is going to work on delimitation, even though Uh, if my geography uh, knowledge serves me right, neither Armenia nor Azerbaijan have never been part of any countries that are currently part of the EU, say so they do not have the maps, whereas Russia does have the necessary maps, and something the both, si both sides are happy with, but the EU is not happy with that, and the U.S. also wants to uh, delimit the border from across the Atlantic. Somehow they have come into possession of some maps from the Russian, uh, from the USSR general staff. You know, it does seem somewhat bizarre. These are adults who are trying to fight for supremacy, who is uh, better, who is more important, who can get additional schools in international affairs. It's deplorable that the self-serving interests of the West prevent Armenia and Azerbaijan from uh, putting into reality their vital essential interests. As far as Russia and Armenia are concerned, we've never been at the origins of any cooling in our ties. Yes, we remember that many of the officials of Armenia, who back then were in opposition, made some statements during the electoral campaign. They made calls for withdrawal from the Eurasian Economic Union, from the um, CSTO. And once uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan arrived in office, We didn't have uh, the slightest urge, as it were, to uh, distance ourselves from Yerevan and our relations. Uh, things continued as they had before in economics, in uh, military, in politics, in other fields. But what you're currently witnessing, you know, I personally participated in the talks that took place in Yerevan in 2022. There was a meeting of the CSTO and a document was endorsed stipulating the dispatch of uh, observers to the border between Azerbaijan and Armenia. The document was agreed upon. Then the leadership uh, of Armenia said that they were not willing, they were not ready to uh, sign the document right away. And uh, almost at the same time, an EU mission was dispatched there. But that was the choice made by the Armenian leadership. The EU mission started to make active inquiries into the activities of our border guards stationed in Armenia rather than working on confidence-building measures. They were trying to sniff out what was happening, what Russia was doing, what Russia was involved in, what girls it was pursuing. This is also well known. We've spoken about that with our Armenian friends. We said, yes, okay, there is an EU mission, and you're more happy with that, but Why not extend a parallel invitation to the CSTO? The answer was, uh, you know, the STO has been a disappointment to Armenia because it has not condemned Azerbaijan. Yes, we know this response. But if we have a look at the original causes of the conflict, then we'll see at each turn Each and every side, both Armenia and Azerbaijan, 
made so many steps that didn't assist progress in the least. So we could go somewhat too far. It would be just trying to shift the blame instead of uh, trying to implement the current agreements that would allow achieving real progress in delimiting the border. I think our Western I think Armenia has made statements that the uh, CSTO and Russia have been a disappointment, whereas the West has not. But it's the choice up to the Armenian leadership. Yes, in our society, among the political scientists and among the media, there are certain opinions on the subject. And sometimes these opinions are expressed very freely. And for certain comments, uh, some uh, people have been uh, declared personi non grata by the Armenian government, which uh, is uh, somewhat – well, this is not seldom seen uh, – often seen in relations between allies and between close friends. We have made many efforts of providing advice, uh, you know, when the um, Charter, the Rome Statute was uh, signed by Armenia, we were providing alternative paths to achieving the same goals Armenia was pursuing in doing so. And, you know, there are often statements uh, uh, from the West that Russia needs to be uh, chased away from South Caucasus, and we do not hear many statements to the country from Yerevan. But I think Russia, Turkey, Iran, the uh, closest uh, countries to the South Caucasus, uh, together with the three countries of the Southern Caucasus, uh, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, they need to work together. We propose this format, and I think this format is going to prevail sooner or later because it's not dependent on the global geopolitical environment. Moreover, this format is immune to the geopolitical machinations with a view to preserving hegemony currently pursued by Washington together with its uh, counterparts from Brussels. I would like to reiterate once again, we have very warm relations with the Armenian people. We have confidence that history is going to uh, put things right. But on our own, we will not be able to solve all these problems. I would hate, you know, to use the hackneyed phrase that, you know, takes two to tango. Uh, Armenia has some uh, more interesting dances than that. Minister, Madam Spokesperson, Rus Tachkeru, as a follow-up uh, on the subject of South Caucasus, I would like to uh, clarify Russian officials have uh, spoken about Moscow's efforts, uh, President Putin's efforts in normalizing the situation in uh, Karabakh. And recently in his interview, President Aliyev said it, it, was, it had been Putin, not President Macron, who has, uh, had helped uh, reestablish peace in the South Caucasus, President Aliyev. So can you tell us whether that increases the uh, possibility here of uh, a peace treaty between Baku and Yerevan being signed on the uh, Russian platform. And uh, second question, if you'll allow me, a couple of weeks ago, the ministry expressed a hope that Afghanistan is going to emerge from international isolation. Uh, Kazakhstan uh, put Taliban off the list of uh, prohibited organizations. So is there a chance that Afghanistan is going to emerge from uh, political diplomatic isolation? And uh, can the same process be applied to Yemen? 
in particular through the recognition of Houthis, because de facto they've been controlling the capital for quite some time as well as a bigger chunk of uh, the territory of Yemen. I, I forgot what you started with. Well, about President Putin having played a role in uh, normalizing relations between Baku and Yerevan, so not Macron, but Putin. The thing is, the agreement was signed by the three leaders uh, of Russia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. I didn't see the signature of uh, President Macron there. And uh, the same goes for the other trilateral agreements and documents signed by the three countries. And I said that on multiple occasions once these agreements started to be put into practice, in particular with regard to the deblocking the roads and also the delimiting of the borders and working on the peace treaty. Once this started to happen, the Americans and the Europeans started to insert themselves actively into these processes. And you know, there was one interesting issue. Remember the documents signed in November 2020, as well as the subsequent documents. In those documents, the territory of Karabakh was designated as an area under the uh, responsibility of the Russian peacekeeping coup. And there was an understanding between the three countries that the status would be a subject for further discussion with a view to finding a final solution. So imagine our surprise when in autumn 2022, somewhere in Prague, if my memory serves me right, President Macron held the European Political Community Conference. So we and Ukrainians were not invited to, even though Armenia and Azerbaijan were represented there. And I think uh, President Macron, together with uh, Charles Michel, proposed a meeting. And during that meeting, they agreed a document saying that Armenia and Azerbaijan recognized the territorial integrity of one another in full conformity with the 1991 Almata Declaration. And that declaration said that all newly independent countries had borders identical to the administrative borders of the Soviet republics of the USSR. So Karabakh was supposed to be a part of the Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, the uh, borders of the autonomous region of Karabakh. We did not know that such uh, a document was and the works. So we made a conclusion. We communicated to Baku and Yerevan. We thought that the issue of Karabakh had been closed personally by Prime Minister Pashinyan. And uh, President Macron had taken part in that process. And I do not know who played what role. And I would be loath to uh, speculate. But our Western counterparts want a peace agreement to be signed in their territory. Azerbaijan is willing to sign a peace agreement in the Russian territory where efforts originated to normalize the situation, to find a settlement. Well, it's a fact, too. Whether Yerevan is willing to do that, I do not know even though we've been uh, sending the relevant signals for quite some time to the capital of Armenia. As for Afghanistan, there are de facto authorities that are really in control of the situation. Yes, there are some hotbeds of protest and of tensions, but generally the uh, Taliban movement uh, is in control, and our embassy never stopped working in Kabul, and it was almost the single embassy that uh, continued working. We've been maintaining regular contacts with Taliban, 
including and inter alia on issues that should be resolved so that Taliban is recognized as a legitimate government. And most importantly, it's about them to keep their promise of creating an inclusive government that would represent not only ethnic Pushtu and other ethnic minorities and groups, but also would be politically inclusive. There are Pushtu and Uzbek and Tajik and Hazar people there, but politically they are Talibs. While politically there is still some opposition left, and the ex-president Karzai still lives there, as well as the uh, former chief executive Abdallah Abdallah, and we advise the Talibs to invite other political forces into a coalition, and the second issue to be resolved is the national opposition front in the north, and bridges must be built there too. It has never been simple in Afghanistan, you know, so it is not simple now either. But we have been keeping a constant eye on what has been happening, and we maintain contacts with the leadership, and that helps us work, including in promoting external formats that help come out with recommendations and guidelines for the Afghans themselves. I'm referring to the Moscow format and the, the Quartet of Russia, China, Pakistan and Iran. I hope that the current uh, exchange of barbs between Iran and uh, Pakistan will not drag, be a drag on that. Well, but you know, Kazakhstan uh, made a special mention that putting Taliban off the terrorist list would not automatically mean a recognition. These are relative things, you know, even the UN Security Council issued a reservation on the Taliban leaders on, on, on those lists that if it is about prospective talks, in these cases, in these events, the, the leaders of Taliban should be put off the lists and excluded from the lists. As regards Yemen, well, you know, after many years, contacts were launched upon the initiative of the Saudi Arabia, the Saudis are now in talks with the Houthis, whether it's viable to resume the talks. I, I do not know. It is hard to say the main point now is to stop the aggression against Yemen. The more the Americans and the British bomb Yemen, the less is the Houthis desire to speak, but this is the inherent style of our Anglo-Saxons colleagues. They always want to trouble the waters everywhere and later from the overseas, from the English Channel and the Atlantic uh, Ocean coast, try to figure how to promote their self-serving interests, uh, Rasiska Gazeta newspaper. Microphone. And good afternoon. My question is as follows: This, 80 years since the deblocking of Leningrad is marked this year. Russia has always wanted to assist all the prisoners and victims of the blockade. Recently, the Russia Gazeta made public some data that around 50,000 people receive financial assistance, including those residing in the EU, while Germany maintains double standards in paying out compensations upon contrived reasons. 
they only uh, the Germans only pay the allowances to Jews, the compensation to Jews, and they would not encompass all other survivors of the blockade. Can you comment on that? We have been addressing that for many, many years when Berlin started paying one-off compensations to the Jewish blockade survivors. We stated it was not fair and we attracted the attention of the Germans. Back then Steinmeier was the foreign minister, the current president, and uh, I explained it to him repeatedly that a lot of people died and suffered irrespective of what their nationality or ethnicity was, Russians, Tatars, Jews, and many others, many other ethnicities. The response was as follows. We are paying to the Jews because we have a law that obliges us to pay amounts to the Holocaust victims. All others cannot fall under this category. I I thought it was blatantly absurd, and I told him that blockade was a unique phenomenon of the World War II, or the Great Patriotic War, when there was no distinction between those who survived by eating stray cats and uh, boiling boots to have broth and uh, burying people. We just wanted to put them to shame. We failed, and the answer was... Well, as the Holocaust law allows for payments, we, we execute those. But if we pay out amounts to all those who do not fall under this category of Holocaust victims, we will have an, an influx of, uh, of lawsuits. I suggested they would enact a special law on the Leningrad blockade survivors, which would be natural. They rejected and put up, came forth with an idea of establishing a house of veterans in, 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 in uh, St. Pete and a Russian German cultural center. I said it was instrumental and useful, probably to promote our civil society's conflicts, but that would not solve the issue of the blockade survivors, even if they are happy with uh, with uh, visiting that cultural center. This is not sufficient because the bulk of the survivors live, live outside uh, St. Pete. Many of them live in, in the Baltic states, and not only in those. And we tried to incentivize non-for-profit entities so that they talk to the Germans via their revenues. And we turned to the European Jewish Congress and to Israel also, saying frankly, that Israel probably should demonstrate solidarity with those who had to survive in the unbearable conditions back then. So we saw no interest in promoting this issue. At the same time, we had found out that there was a blue division, a blue division compiled of and made up of the Spaniards, it sided with the Wehrmacht in the World War II, and they also participated in the blockade of Leningrad. And the veterans of that blue division still receive payments from the German state, while the blockade survivors, tortured by the invaders, are now, now, are now in a disadvantaged situation. But, you know, the ruling class of Germany 
is historically oblivious of many things. They have the amnesia. Well, the the expositions dedicated to the Second World War and the joint expositions between the Soviet and German experts are being reconfigured to remove the joint track with the Soviet and Russian participation. Same goes for the memorial complexes and uh, facilities in the ex-concentration camps and the and the building where the capitulation was signed by the German Nazi side. So we are now seeing the degradation of the underpinnings of the post-war German society that obtained an identity that was credited worldwide. And now we can see that these uh, instincts come to the fore. RT Deutsch. Roman Ziskin, RT Deutsch. As a follow-up to on the previous question, not long ago it became known that Germany is the third party in litigation between South Africa and Israel on genocide. The German government made a statement on that. They said, I quote, Germany's history and crimes against humanity Well, they, they, they reject the Shoah genocide case. They act as an advocate of Israel. And you called several, you named several examples on Dresden, saying that they are trying to step aside from their commitments. And in this respect, Namibia also criticized them, a victim of genocide of the early 20th century. And that was condemned, condemned in 1985, and uh, the Soviet peoples were the main victims of the Ost. Horrible, horrendous plan to strip of life or dislodge 31 million people. And in Germany now we can see that Nazism is, is approved more and more often. And, and uh, they say that uh, the the ancestors participated in the defense of Königsberg and they that they are citing they're on the right side of the history but you know Russia has bore the burden and the brunt of of that war liberating the world from the Nazis and uh, suffering huge victims what is the plan of Russia to counter the trends that uh, make themselves manifest in Germany and in Europe. What are planning for this and next year? This reflects, as I have already said, the degradation of the moral tenets of the Western society that took shape after the Second World War and they were meant to be guarded probably generations changed and the new generations do not recall the horrors of the Second World War, but that does not strip their government and other governments from responsibility to avoid any oblivion or, or any return to those moral principles of the pre-Second World War period. And definitely, we are upset by these manifestations and uh, uh, also by the fact that the Germans were offered quite a clumsy explanation with respect to their position on the uh, lawsuit of South Africa to Israel. That was quite bizarre. They said, we were the organizers of genocide and we will protect, hence, those who are accused of genocide, I cannot see any 
straightforward logic in this. Well, I said already that providing for Israel's security means a lot for us. It's overarching. In the context of a full and comprehensive resolution in the Middle East, speaking about double and triple standards, when Air Lapid was Israel's prime minister, He said many a thing about our special military operation, saying it was unacceptable when indiscriminate and sweeping attacks are committed using arms. And he said that it was a military crime that made civilians suffer. And several, several months ago, when the government changed there, Responding to the criticism over in sweeping and discriminated application of arms and lots of victims, mortal victims uh, among children and women and other civilians, they respond, responded it is a war tragedy, nothing more. You know, on, on the one hand, we have this special, special military operation with the number of civil casualties not even close anywhere close to, to to the number of mortal victims of that Gaza conflict. But in one case, it is a moral, uh, it is a war crime. In the other case, it's a moral tragedy. You know, so we should come to terms about that. You know, there are some tenets of the international law and we have been in observance of the rules of international norm. We have been impacting precisely the military and related infrastructure facilities of the Ukrainian army. The fact that the Ukrainians deploying and station their troops in residential quarters is, is long known. And that happened constantly after the start of the operation. It is their style to use civilians as human shields, which is absolutely banned by the international humanitarian law. Definitely the laws of the war must be observed. And I also mentioned that the retired American generals and the, uh, the current British politicians advise the Ukrainians to impact Crimea as hard as they can. Once you cannot succeed on the battlefield, just try to annoy and irritate Russians, erasing the Crimea from the map with your